This lecture is the third of a set of three which are entitled The Right Stuff. And what I've been trying to do in these lectures is explore something about what it is, what, it, what we think about good quality decision making in medicine. And I talked a bit in the first lecture about the role of emotions in, in ethical reasoning in medicine. And in my last lecture, I was exploring something about how we manage information in medicine and the complexities of keeping things private in a world where boundaries between people are very different to how they used to be. And in this last lecture, I really want to explore what we think is important for doctors to know. And I'm particularly interested in this because I do a little bit of work with doctors who struggled in their, in their work. And I'm very grateful um, in preparing this lecture. I really just wanted to acknowledge my colleagues, Professor Deborah Bowman, who's Professor of Medical Ethics at St. George's, and Professor Claire Gerarda, uh, with whom, uh, who runs the Practitioner's Health Programme, which is a programme specifically addressing the, the health of doctors. And, <clears throat> and both these colleagues have been very important and supportive in helping me understand and think about what makes a, a good doctor, how we help doctors develop a professional identity. And I'm going to be exploring <coughs> three particular domains tonight. I'm going to be looking at knowledge, empathy and virtue. So starting off with knowledge, this is what, for those of you who aren't uh, trained in medicine, this is what people often fondly imagine most of medicine is like. Very little of medical training involves this, I'm glad to say. Um, but there is, of course, a big emphasis on the getting, on the acquisition of knowledge. And what we find is that when people, when we take medical students to start with, Obviously, these are very smart young people who have acquired lots of information as a way of passing uh, very hard exams. And there's a big emphasis still throughout the medical training on acquiring lots of information and retrieving it under timed conditions. But of course, in the actual practice of medicine, that's not necessarily what's going to be most helpful. And what we usually find is that, say, the first-year medical students often focus very much on unusual information, and, but not on how data systems work, about how you put information from different systems together. And in fact, what we really want is, by the fifth year, is we want to get people in a situation where they're asking about what they don't know and being aware of what might be missing. What, they, what might they not be seeing from their particular perspective. And as we know, lots of people uh, use Dr. Google um, in order to explore um, their symptoms and their signs. Um, and I don't think it's any secret that most doctors slightly, you know, um, feel slightly anxious when a person comes in with a list of printouts from the computer, from the internet. Because I guess one of the difficulties about the internet is the lack of quality control. And there's often, and data is often presented very uncritically. And I think we've seen this as a particular problem, for example, in relation to, to vaccines. But maybe the biggest problem, I think, with the, the internet is that there is no way to relate different domains of knowledge together. And the one thing that we know about the human body, and it's remarkable how little we know, really, but the one thing we do know about the human body is, is it is made up of multiple regulatory systems that are all interacting together. And you have to take a holistic and multi-systemic approach. And the difficulty about some of the ways that informa medical information is presented on the internet is it doesn't provide a type of integrative uh, perspective. Um, it doesn't provide any advice, again, and, and help you think about what's not there and how to assess those symptoms or signs that are not present that might be very important. And so there may be sometimes a bit of a potential for overemphasis on getting more scans and more tests, which actually sometimes don't provide a great deal more information, um, are very expensive. And, and of course, in the NHS, it, we cost it slightly differently, but in the United States, there's a real issue about increasing amounts of, of scans and tests that actually put up the medical bill dramatically, but don't always uh, give you much information. But what is so that you really don't get something from the internet is this sense of how things are connected to each other. And of course, it doesn't give you that personal quality, um, which is so important to the human, the human experience of being ill or suffering sickness. Um, and P.J. O'Rourke, uh, some of you may know this, but he's a lovely distinction 
between information and knowledge. Um, and PJ O'Rourke says that you know, you know, having Christy Turlington's number, her phone number, is not the same as knowing her. And that's an important distinction, I think, between the amount of information that you get when you're training as a doctor and then the actual knowledge of what it is to be a practitioner. So how do we transform information into knowledge? Well, there's a nice uh, book uh, written a few years ago now about how doctors think. <coughs> and what Dr. Groupman explores in this book is something about thought patterns, heuristics, the, and algorithms, the way that doctors tend to put information together. And what this, what this, their systems are really about, of course, is based on experience, but also is about organizing information so that they can tolerate the uncertainty of not knowing. A very important aspect of being a doctor is dealing with the uncertainty of knowing what these various symptoms and signs and data mean. And of course, the person who's got the problem is also anxious about and, and uncertain too. So what these heuristics and algorithms and thinking patterns do is they give doctors a way of sifting through large amounts of possibilities about what might be wrong. And it, it, it sort of, but it, you have to somehow maintain a tolerance of uncertainty while maintaining a type of complexity, because it's all too easy to go for very obvious solutions and not think about less common ones. And the other thing that doctors have to learn to do over the course of their training, but especially in the early years of practice, is the wisdom of not acting. The times when it's very important not to do anything but just to sit and to wait and also to listen to what people are telling you about their experiences. Also sometimes listen to what their families are telling you about their experiences. This is, I'm speaking of course, this is all especially true in, in, in mental health where it's much harder of course to scan or test and where you rely so much on, a, on an interpersonal dialogue between yourself and the patient and the patient's family. So here is a case which is live, of course, right now, where we're wanting, um, I think, you know, the courts to exp have the wisdom of Solomon. Again, I won't, I won't go into this in great detail because you're familiar with it, but this is a, a live case of a, of a baby who is dying. And um, his parents not unnaturally find it very difficult to accept that there is nothing else to be done, and they want to take him to the United States in order to get him a, a treatment that they, I think, hope might give him a bit of extended life. And they have had masses of pediatric information, information from very experienced doctors, <coughs> that this is not going to be helpful. But they don't want to accept it. And as you probably know, um, they're taking their case now to the European Court of Human Rights um, in order to test, that, to test that out, because that tension between the medical knowledge and the parents' knowledge, yeah. I think, beautifully and painfully exemplifies the difference of perspective that happens in medicine. These parents see things very differently from the doctors, and that's inevitable, and sometimes that clash of perspectives is what makes the practice of medicine truly tragic. And Miranda Fricker has, is an academic who has talked about epistemic injustice, injustice where people's voices are not heard, where there's injustice because different types of views about experience are not expressed. And in this particular case, you know, it may well be that Baby G's <coughs> parents really feel a type of injustice. I mean, they have been unsuccessful in all the, other, in all the English courts till now. Up till now, the English courts have preferred the medical perspective to baby G's parents' perspective. And one of the reasons that that's the case is that medical opinion is not just based on baby G's situation, but on a perspective of many, many cases and the integration of multiple pieces of information, multiple experiences, whereas baby G's poor parents only have one perspective, that is their own and a very painful and distressing one it is too. And it, uh, nobody here, I'm sure, we feel, would feel anything but desperate sympathy for their, for their situation. And the courts need good quality types of knowledge to help them deal with these extraordinary types of decisions. 
This is a rather splendid uh, slide from a 17th century picture of doctors, um, apparently en courant. Um, and, uh, but not many doctors, I think, get up on horseback in armor these days, but it's a rather splendid, uh, noble picture. Um, and it's just a reminder to me to talk about how important it is for doctors to be thoughtful about the painful emotions that they have to face. That in, in a way I've been talking about knowledge, but I want now to move on to think about the type of psychological capacity that's necessary to deal with the emotions that you have to face as a doctor. And I talked in my first lecture about the type of emotional knowledge that I think doctors need in order to face some of the dilemmas that they have to. But in the care of others often raises very painful and challenging emotions. And these are, you know, fear, pain, distress, even disgust. It has to be said, it's a feeling that you can have when you're looking after somebody. Um, and Daniel Offrey has published a very interesting book a couple of years ago called What Doctors Feel, and she talks about how important it is to manage some of the negative and painful and uncomfortable feelings that often arise when you're, when you're looking after somebody who's very sick, who has very traumatizing injuries, who has a very disturbing type of medical condition, that causes all sorts of feelings in the doctors that are looking after them. It's not a, and, and, and if you're not to be completely cut off from those feelings, then somehow you're going to have to experience them and manage them. What Isabel Mingus lies called the emotional labor of caring. And I'm just going to say a little bit more about that because Isabel Mingus lies did a very interesting study she was asked to come in and consult to a hospital where all the nursing staff were leaving in droves. And um, there was a very high sickness rate, and they would train people up, and then they would, they would disappear. And what she found out by going and talking to staff was that there was a huge split, really, between the hospital administration and the staff on the ground, and that the hospital administration really didn't want to know about the suffering in the staff. This was principally nurses, but also doctors. And, they was a, and, and because they didn't want to know about that, but there was a big responsibility was put particularly on junior staff, and senior staff were sent off to meetings and kept well away from the distress on the ward. So it was the most junior staff who were often dealing with the biggest distress. And so there was something, a, a type of unconscious avoidance of getting close to people who were suffering. And what Mingus Lyes talks about is a type of denigration, almost, of the people who are trying to relate clinically to patients, a denigration of, getting, of the process of getting too close. And yet, we know that when you both elicit care from people and you give care to people, a type of bond grows up between you. But I think one of the concerns that there is in current 21st century medicine, particularly in the NHS, is real concerns about this type of unconscious pushing away of a type of attachment and care, and whether that helps us to understand a little bit of what happened in Mid Staffordshire Hospital and the appalling failures of care that took place there. I put this slide up about antisocial personalities, and you may think, what on earth is that doing there? But this is, um, this is a list of characteristics um, of, of people who are, uh, of what people who act criminally are typically like. This is from the 1970s. And I just really wanted to put it up here because I think it's an interesting list in terms of the sort of things you don't expect to see in healthcare professionals. That, in fact, we tend to select healthcare professionals as people who are actually very engaged at school, who actually try and engage with others, are not necessarily thrill-seekers, are not angry or unempathic. Um, and who do feel a lot of obligations to people. That, and we don't expect to see people with this type of personality profile in medicine at all. But what we think is that we want to use, we have a big question, I think, about how we want to develop empathy in doctors. Um, we want to, how do we help people to understand the emotional experience of being a patient as well as being a doctor? So some of you may know that there are now medical humanities courses that have been going for about 20 years. There's a journal of medical humanities. And that allows us to use 
the arts in, in particular as a form of moral imagination and also allows doctors to look at different value perspectives in medical practice. And I'm glad to say, they say there are journals, research, and there's courses. And of course, there's television, many, many, many <coughs> television programs about doctors. Absolutely fascinating, the rise. There's a whole PhD there, I think, on, on the depiction of doctors and television, uh, both bad and good. And I guess that many people um, are drawn, have been drawn to medicine by Chekhov's wonderful uh, stories about his practice. But some of you may be more familiar with Dr. Gregory House, a somewhat troubled doctor um, who exemplifies the type of brilliance around information retrieval, but not very good emotionally with other people. And not, in fact, very good, of course, with his own pain either. And there's a strong theme within the series, um, if you ever watched it, about his inability to deal with his own pain is one of the things that makes him such a flawed doctor. So coming out to think about empathy, and it, there are lots of definitions of empathy, and the study of empathy is a huge uh, topic in its own right, but I guess we could briefly summarise um, or define empathy as the, uh, the capacity to recognise other people's states of mind as both real and different to your own. Um, and I've been very influenced by the work of Professor Jean de Setti um, from Canada. And he, along with many other colleagues over the last 30 years, has probably done most work on the psychological experience of empathy, but also, interestingly, the neuropsychiatry of empathy and the bits of your brain that light up when you, experience, when you start to think about other people's minds. And we know that there are two strands to empathy. There's a thinking aspect, a cognitive aspect, and a feeling aspect, an affective aspect. Um, and, there's ve and the neuroarchitecture that's involved when you think about other people's minds is actually physically very close to the bit, bit of the brain that deals with self-recognition, interestingly. And there was a review by Desetti and Moriguchi several years ago, 10 years ago now, which suggested that actually one of the common features of psychiatric disorders is that they cause a lack of empathy in people. Now, that doesn't mean that people with psychiatric disorders are all unkind or uncaring, far from it, but what it does mean is that they are sometimes not very good at recognising other people's minds as being real or different from their own. And there are, and there are many types of psychiatric symptom which actually are a feature of not being able to distinguish your own mind from somebody else's. Now, I think over the last few years, there's been an, uh, an identification of empathy as being morally valuable in itself, a moral, a moral good, and that people, who, on the, in the implication being that if you lack empathy, you are not a virtuous person, that you are not a good person. Um, and Simon Baron Cohen is uh, partly responsible for this. You may know that Professor Baron Cohen is an expert in autism. Um, and he is one of the people who demonstrated that people with um, autism lack a theory of mind, and particularly lack a theory of mind for recognising how other people might feel. And he wrote, Professor Baron Cohen wrote a book in which he compared people with autism with people with antisocial personality disorder and suggested that people with autism had a type of lack of empathy that was a sort of good kind of lack of empathy and that antisocial offenders had a bad type of lack of empathy. Um, and there's a, but criminal offenders tend to lack both types. Um, and, he, <coughs> and, he's, and he's arguing that we shouldn't blame people who are autistic because they have a neurobiological condition that they can't help. And this is important for us in thinking about how on earth you develop empathy in people like doctors, who you want, if you want doctors to be empathic, and many people think we do want doctors to be empathic, um, then because it comes into understanding other people's perspectives, on well, how on earth do we develop that? And it's complicated because actually there's not as much evidence as you would think that offenders and people who do bad things lack empathy. Um, in fact, it's, it's a, a bit counterintuitive, but it's true. There actually isn't much evidence that, um, about that. Many offenders have exactly the same levels of empathy as, as you or I do. Um, they sometimes may have more empathy um, when it comes to uh, particularly offences against other people that they're close to. Um, 
And offenders who, and there's actually no reason to think that people, offenders who lack empathy are any different from, pe from people with autism. That actually the lack may be very similar, and offenders who lack empathy may have a similar type of neurobiological problem as people with autism. Um, and it may be that the offenders that don't get caught um, have a lot of empathy, and that's why they don't get caught. And that skews the figures. So, and I think we might also really want to ask some questions, some quite searching questions about whether it's really true that empathy is evidence of goodness. Um, and of course it depends a bit on how you define it. And if it means feeling distress when other people are distressed, then that may be, no, that may be neither good nor bad. It may be value neutral. There may be situations where feeling distress when other people are feeling distress is useful or kindly. There may be other times when it's not at all. And a, an interesting paper published earlier on this year suggested that too much personal investment in other people's distress may actually be bad for you and may actually mean that you don't handle stress well yourself. And this is important for trainee doctors because it may be that it's very important to have us think about how much empathy you do deliver, to develop um, over the course of a medical training. And there's a big problem about how you measure empathy uh, meaningfully without confusing it with a simple agreement with people. Oh, yes, I completely understand how you feel. Um, or I, I, in sympathy, I feel the same. I know when I was in that situation, I feel the same way. Um, and at present, we tend to... We tend to assess empathy in medical students by observing them. Um, and there's a big question, I think, about whether that's really the best way to assess empathy. Um, it is, as I say, empathy is thought to be a key aspect of care in clinical practice. Um, and one of the interesting findings is that young people going into medical school have similar levels of empathy to everybody else. Um, but by about year three, their empathy levels have dropped. If you use the same measure of empathy, you can reliably show that ju junior doctors in training have a decrease in empathy as they go on in their training. And one of the things that we don't know is what to think about this. On the face of it, it looks as though it might be a worry. But at another level, it actually might be a very sensible and human way to defend yourself against too much distress. If you're going to have a long and happy and rich life as a professional carer, then you may need to be able to manage your distress very carefully and thoughtfully. And a turning down of empathy may be a very important way to do that. It may indeed be a very important step in the development <coughs> of resilience and possibly even compassion. It may be that what we're really wanting is to help people, help junior doctors and these senior doctors to develop and maintain a capacity for compassion and, de and developing a type of compassion for vulnerability and suffering and helplessness. And one of the things that comes out of the compassion literature is that it may be important to start with self-compassion. That actually being, rather than saying to... So rather than the doctors saying to themselves, well, I'm just not going to think about my own pain, I'm not going to think about my own distress, actually taking pain and distress seriously actually empowers people to deal with it better. And there's a, as I say, there's a complex relationship between empathy and burnout in physicians. And it may be that we need to be helping junior doctors and indeed senior doctors understand their emotional reactions to patients in a much more complex and nuanced way. And I want now to move to talk about virtue and what uh, a virtuous doctor uh, would look like. And one of the reasons that I think that this is important for us to talk about is two reasons, really. One is that I think it goes right to the heart of the idea of a doctor being a good person. I think the assumption that doctors are, tr are trusted uh, one of the most trusted professions, because they're trusted to be good people. And it has within it, I think the practice of med medicine, in medical ethics, has this notion of Aristotelian notions of character, that you practice virtue. By practicing virtue on a regular basis, that's what makes you virtuous. But I also think that there's an aspect of medicine in which there's a type of moral standard um, that, and, that doctors are called to, 
because of the vulnerability that they have to manage. I was trying to explain something of this in my first lecture, where in caring for others, we are inevitably getting alongside people who are vulnerable, who are helpless, who may be suffering. And we have opportunities. That would be an opportunity to exploit that if we were so minded. So one of the, the, the reputation of the profession rests on a trust that you can trust your doctor to do the right thing, to be honest and to not take advantage of your vulnerability. And that higher moral standard in the terms of the nature of the profession is another reason, I think, why we look for virtue in our doctors. Um, and we worry a lot about doctors who are, not, who are not virtuous. And I was very influenced in thinking about this by uh, Jennifer Radden, who's written a very interesting book about virtue in medicine. But what this raises is a very interesting question about personal and professional identities. Could you be a good doctor but a bad person? Is there any way that you could separate the, as it were, the who-ness of you, your personal life, from the whatness of you when you're a doctor in, in practice? Um, and what does it mean to say to hold what does it mean to hold doctors to a higher moral standard? And what does it mean to train doctors to be, to function at a higher moral standard? How do you do that exactly? Do you select people to be more virtuous than, than others? Or do you hope to develop a type of incre increased moral sensitivity throughout the training period and, of course, thereafter? So it is, it's absolutely clear that the General Medical Council, on behalf of all of us, um, holds doctors to a high standard and doctors are found unfit to practice when they brought the profession into disrepute because of the impact on trust. And this is what we think of, I think, when in relation to good doctors, we think about altruism, we think about sacrifice, we think about courage. This is from the Médecins Sans Frontières uh, website and they are extraordinary. Uh, doctors in the way, the epitome, I think, of what we think of as a virtuous doctor. This is a picture of a bad doctor. And these are the homicide rates um, for England and Wales over the last 20-odd years. And you will see that there is a little spike. And the little spike is Dr Shipman. The little spike... Um, is thought to be the 200 deaths brought about by Dr. Shipman, which substantially altered the general rates for homicide. As you can see, if I just go back, you can see that generally speaking, homicide rates have been going down nicely over the last, um, over the last uh, 25 years or so. Just got this one little spike. And so, but I think the key issue for both these gentlemen is that they were both previously seen as good doctors. That from on, on a day-to-day -day basis, many of the people who worked with them saw them as good doctors, honest doctors, trustworthy doctors. Not everybody saw them as being difficult, especially Dr. Shipman, where many, many of his colleagues and his patients talked about what a wonderful doctor he was. So I'm wondering, of course, what it means if you are an excellent doctor 90% of the time, and that 10% you are really not a good doctor at all. And that takes me on to talking about boundary violations and misconduct um, by doctors. Um, doctors have very few of the risk factors for criminality that I set out earlier on. It's very rare um, for doctors to have any of the usual risk factors, but the only ones that you might see are being male and substance misuse. Um, those are known risk factors for, for criminality, but otherwise it's very rare for doctors to have any, um, any, of the, any of the risk factors. And the other thing, of course, is that boundary violations, uh, in particular professional boundary violations, are often committed by much older doctors, so they're not by doctors in training. The GMC take very seriously all types of crimes and conduct that might be related to work, so dishonesty, assaults, improper relationships with patients. Crimes and conduct unrelated to work, they do occur, but quite rarely. So obviously, people like Dr. Shipman are sort of, sort of unicorn-like rare. Um, 
And it's very rare for doctors to get into trouble with the criminal law in anything apart from work. But one of the things that we really don't understand too well is what makes doctors lose sight of professional boundaries in the, when these things happen. <coughs> we think that early attachments may be, may be relevant. We think that there are often relational disturbances in the family outside of practice of medicine. And there's some interesting questions to be asked about migration trauma because doctors who have qualified in countries outside the EU and the UK, people who have qualified are what are called international medical graduates, are overrepresented amongst doctors who are dealt with at the General Medical Council. And what that, that doesn't mean that international medical training is poor, but it does raise a question of what happens, what it means to move countries and whether some of the doctors who get into trouble have in fact been forced migrants or refugees from other countries um, and that's contributed to the stress that may have led to them um, breaking the rules. Because really the amount of serious boundary violations is very small. The numbers of doctors who seriously break the rules is very small. Um, it's only, there are, there are only 3% or so every year very small number of doctors that get reported to the GMC. Most of those come from members of the public. Others come from other public bodies. But of those complaints, only a quarter go forward because they're not, often they're not really complaints about the doctor's conduct or behaviour. They're, they're complaints about a, about a service which are nothing to do with the doctor. And of those early investigations, only again about 10% actually go through to a fitness to practice panel and if you get as far as going to a fitness to practice panel, you're, you know, it's pretty clear that you've done something that's really, that really has led to concerns about your fitness to be a doctor, your fitness to have that identity, to have that moral identity. You have brought the profession into disrepute. And, and you can see from the figures that you know, a substantial group are erased from the register, another substantial group are actually suspended with the possibility of reviewing. But lots of concerns, what, what the GMC are concerned about, what the fitness to practice hearings, what they investigate, is concerns about ill health in doctors, concerns about criminal behavior, dishonesty, competence, fair treatment, and general professional competence. The reason I'm laboring this a little bit is that all the doctors who end up in fitness to practice hearings have had a long and complicated medical training They've often had a long and complicated apprenticeship as a junior and then a senior doctor. And what we're interested in, I think, what we ought to be interested in, because this costs a lot of money, um, it costs a lot of money to lose doctors from practice, and particularly at a time when people are retiring, we don't want to lose doctors. What we're we need to try and understand is how do these doctors come to lose sight of their moral identity? How do they come to act with a lack of virtue? And that brings me back to the question again about how you acquire virtue. These are not typically bad people. These are not typical criminals. To say that they, they are, as it were, really bad people underneath is, I think, to, to misunderstand or miss sight of a quite complex process that's gone on. There are, of course, real concerns about the exploitation of the vulnerable, and that's the, that, of course, is the worry with... With both, with, with both Dr. Shipman and Mr. Patterson. But our current responses to these things are to name and shame people and, and deploy a culture of deterrence. And that may work. It doesn't seem to stop people getting into trouble with the GMC, but maybe that is the only way to go. But what I've noticed is that it's very difficult to get access, rehabilitation and treatment for doctors who have committed acts that we might think of as being offensives against the medical profession, offences against virtue in medicine. And of course I'm interested in this because of my day job and I work with other types of offenders and I know that rehabilitation is helpful there. I know that treatment is helpful there. So I get worried that there aren't similar access to rehabilitation and treatment for doctors who offend. Not least of all because A, they should be very treatable and B, it is way expensive uh, not to do so. But it's an adversarial process. When it comes to it, uh, these hearings are adversarial. Just like and doctors who go wrong are just treated just like other offenders. They may lack insight. They may blame patients um, in some way. They may minimise 
what they've done. They may blame alcohol and drugs. They may say the things that many offenders say. So it's complicated. But what's interesting is that these are the types of self-justification and excuse process that you know, happens in almost any adversarial situation. And there's something here about not really thinking about what's going on in the mind of the patient and about whether what it takes to keep other people's minds in your mind. And I, in a previous lecture, I talked about this, and we call it mentalising, the process of keeping mind in mind. And so I think for doctors who get into trouble with the GMC, doctors who don't act virtuously, there's a type of lack of mentalising. So they only see their reality. They don't see the impact of what they're doing, and they intellectualise. But I think particularly the worry is that they are not mentalising feelings of vulnerability. And again, the reason I'm labouring this a little bit is that I want us to think about how you train that into people, how you get people to take vulnerability seriously, how you get people to take weakness and neediness seriously, how you deal with hubris, the type of attitude of grandiosity and entitlement. Um, and occasionally... So we, we have, I think, some concerns that the vast majority of doctors who get into trouble with the GMC are male. So that makes them like other offenders. And that remains a big question, I think, for us about what it is about some accounts of masculinity that make rule-breaking more possible or more likely. And this, of course, uh, for those of you who don't know, these are the 15 men who were present at the Vance conference you know, who planned the final solution, so the mass murder of a, uh, a, a significant subgroup of the citizenry, citizenry who were known by these men to be innocent of any crime. Uh, there were several lawyers here um, whose job it was to articulate a type of legal, uh, a, a legal account of what they were going to do. And I think it's just very important because these are, men, these are men, again, like many doctors, who are intelligent, highly intelligent, highly educated, thoughtful people. How did they come to lose sight of, of, of virtue? And I think there may be something here about the idealization of medicine, that I think that if medicine is too idealized, if we put doctors on a pedestal, if we say that doctors must have a, a higher moral character than anyone else, then we're setting them up to fail. I think there's a problem that where you idealise people, then denigration is not far behind. And if you treat doctors as godlike creatures, you invite them to play God and then are appropriately angry and distressed when it doesn't, when it doesn't work. And I think behind this idealisation and denigration is a very real anxiety and distress, and perhaps a wish to deny just how painful the realities of suffering and death are in medicine. They are always present in, 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 in medical treatment. The worry about suffering and death is always there. And I think that this tendency to idealise or denigrate doctors, I think, is part of trying not to think about that. So we have a big question, I think, about how to hold doctors to a higher moral standard. Moral identity is arguably still being formed, at, um, certainly at 18, um, and, so, and I think well into the you know, third decade. Some people would argue our moral identity is constantly being formed and renegotiated over the course of a lifetime, and that moral identity and moral development doesn't stop when you get to a certain age. So the question about how you develop moral identity of doctors in, in students in particular but also how will employers develop doctors' moral identity? Now in the NHS in particular, where doctors are employees of trusts, how will trusts develop the type of moral identity that we, as service users and patients, want our doctors to have? How will we get their moral identity? To How will the trusts enable a moral identity as well as their work identity? And this is an important distinction between it from 100, or 100 years ago where doctors had their own professional separate identity from their, from, and with a framework of values that gave them their identities as doctors. And there is a serious tension in the NHS. In public health, there is a serious, public health care, there's a serious tension 
because the moral identity of a professional person involves a commitment to values. But um, that's what a profession means. It's in support of faith. In support of faith and altruism and compassion and the best quality care. And, you, we, and some of you will know that there are other professional groups who have a simple profession and a final profession. And that's part of developing your core personal identity as a professional. But employees provide a service or carry out tasks assigned. And I don't think you can buy a faith with a, with a paycheck. And so we, we should have public anxiety, I think, about trusts who claim to high, offer a high quality care, but struggle to do this within their budgets. And then they cut clinical services, frontline clinical services, but don't acknowledge that they've done so. And doctors who complain may be sacked. And then public money, are public money, wasted on legal actions. And most egregious case a couple of years ago, Dr. Matu, a cardiologist who expressed concerns about the level of beds provided for cardiac care um, and was suspended for seven years, suspended on full pay, um, and then sacked in 2010. Um, and he was eventually found to have been unfairly sacked and was awarded £1.2 million pounds in compensation. That's your and my tax pounds, guys, going in a completely pointless type of a legal exercise. So I want to end by thinking about the training of doctors, about how we help doctors, not just students and junior doctors, but also senior doctors, to continue to develop knowledge and wisdom that where we use the information that we gather to, to deepen our understanding of what suffering is like and what we can do about it. I think we need to help doctors develop a type of compassion for themselves as well as for others, and what my friend Penelope Campling calls intelligent kindness. I think that if we en enhance doctors' capacities for self-reflection and mentalizing, that might help them manage when it comes to making mistakes and managing some of the difficult emotions that can, ar can arise in medical practice. And I think we have to think in a very mature and thoughtful way about the tension between business values and professional values in medicine and how that works when we're thinking about the delivery of, of healthcare services for the future. And I'm going to end with one of my favourite pictures, most appropriately, Titian's Allegory of Prudence. Um, and I think that that's a good place to stop. Thank you for listening.